Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. I'm really pleased to welcome an old friend of mine and former colleague, Andrea Kennedy. Uh, Andrea's been working in the accessibility field for Yonks now. Um, really good to have you here, Andrea. And your topic is an interesting one because we're not talking about Wales and we're not going to talk about uh, what's going on in the UK. We're actually going to talk about what you're doing in Turkey right now um, around accessibility and, and what the the approaches are that you're encountering as you start to work towards inclusion uh, in a different part of the world. So thank you for joining us. Well, that's great. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, it's a, a show that I've watched every week, thoroughly enjoyed, so it's nice to be on it. Well, thank you. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, have a friendly face. Um, so I know how you got involved in, in Turkey, um, but for our audience, what, how, how did you come to uh, start doing business uh, in, in a country that's quite a long way from Wales? Uh, it certainly is. <laughs> so tell us the back story. There is a back story. I mean, it's quite a nice one. Mm. Uh, my co-director and also my partner uh, is Turkish. So when he first came to this country quite a few years ago, um, I think I'd been asked to um, video uh, an event for the Welsh government, uh, which was asking people with learning difficulties how they wanted to be to be spoken to and how they wanted to be treated uh, by their authority, their local authority. And I was tasked with gathering as much information, mostly on video. Uh, and he came along and when he saw that actually people with learning difficulties have a say uh, and an influence in, in their daily lives, in their work, in their education, uh, in their healthcare, he was uh, moved to tears and said, I want this for my country. Um, and it was something that we, way back when, we decided we were going to do. And obviously, I visited Turkey on numerous occasions before we actually started working uh, in Istanbul and Ankara. And I fell in love with the Turkish nation. So I consider myself very much Welsh, but a little bit Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's how we decided Turkey. Excellent. So... Um what would you say is the sort of general perception of disability equality among uh, the population of Turkey? How, how do people approach it? Is it is it something that's well understood? No, no, and it's and I think culturally comparing it to the UK, it's a vast cultural difference. Um, within Turkey, it's not really understood that if you have a disability. You can go on and, and do amazing things. You can get a fantastic job. You can live perfect lives. That's not generally understood. I think what tends to happen is that if you have a child with a disability, um, you automatically assume that you will look after that child for the rest of your life. That child may not have the same opportunities as a child without a disability. Now, obviously, that's not for everybody in Turkey. Um, and it's the same here as, and, and, and everywhere else across the world that those with uh, that are more affluent obviously have far better chances. Um, and that's no surprise. But it's not to say that the Turkish nation do not care about disability equality. They, they absolutely do. Um, it's just that from their background and from their perspective, they care personally and they think it's their responsibility. It's only now... And I would say these last two or three years, uh, because we, we've been in Turkey for quite a while now, and these last two or three years, we can say there's almost a, a kind of disability equality revolution starting. Uh, and the perception is slowly, slowly starting to change. Okay, so, so Andrea, so it's, it pro this is probably related with the, with the, fam with the family oh. social structure in Turkey. So... Uh, do you believe uh, a shift in the perception is is going to be possible without uh, you know uh, some guidance from the government? I don't believe so. Um, sorry, guys, I'm sip of tea. <laughs> I don't believe so. Um, unless the government have many many laws and acts uh, regarding disability legislation, so. 
Um, there's the labor law, which covers everybody, but also covers um, there's clauses in there for people with disabilities to avoid discrimination. Um, there's all kinds of laws. There's the, the Disability Act itself, uh, which is uh, law number 5378. But, and that's just two. I mean, there are literally, uh, I think, about 12 different laws and, and acts and guidances relating to people with disability in, in uh, all areas of life. But the problem is, even though these acts are there and this law and this legislation is there, the skill set and perhaps the comprehension of the complex uh, nature of disability is not there. So how can you, even though you have this policy and you have this act, there is no guidance to go along with it. There is no understanding of, of, of what to do next or how to deal with this. So if I can give you an example, um, there is a, a form of positive discrimination that um, every uh, Turkish company that has over um, 50 employees has to have uh, 3% of its staff with disabilities. So everybody thinks that's, that's pretty good. You're guaranteed to get 3%. And if it's a government organization, it needs to be 4% of a large workforce with a disability. But what happens is that disability is is scored on a um, is classified on, a, on an unusual basis. So um, a person will go along with his CV and he will say, I am 40 percent disabled. Mm -hmm. So this um, classification system is created by uh, the healthcare section of the government. Um, and they will say they will merit you on, on your disability a percentage style. So then you get your CV, gets put out there. A company knows it needs to take on 3%. It'll pick up your CV and it'll employ you. Now, what capacity it's employing you in, it makes very, very, very little um, impact or benefit to that person because most of the jobs are not uh, meaningful jobs and not meaningful roles. So what we have is the perception needs to be changed from the very, very top. So government need to bring in a lot more understanding and a lot more uh, skill sets, feed down throughout the government and police these policies and get these policies working, aid the comprehension and understanding. But okay. it also needs to be taken from a business point of view as well. Yeah. So we, we had a really good discussion with Susan Scott Parker from the Business Disability Forum a couple yeah. of months back. And and she was pretty much calling for the end of quota systems because of what you've just described, which is the sort of marking of people as a percentage disabled and the higher percentage disabled, the more points you give a company. Um, but there's no incentive to give anyone a decent quality job. Absolutely. Uh, they're, they're all uh, muck jobs, you know, yeah. really terrible, you know, the career prospects for people that are taken in through the quota systems usually into sheltered workshops or dead-end jobs. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and so there needs to be a change in perception. So I think that that's a sign of immaturity of, of, of an understanding of, of what you can achieve as a person with a disability these days with the help of technology, with the right kind of backing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's not to say that, the, that this is a criticism of the government because they're, these are steps that, that countries take because they need to, to move something on. And I think exactly. it's, it's, yeah. and it's I think we a were there. transitional process. Yeah. So, yeah. I think we were there like uh, 20 years ago. I mean, even now we, we, we do some work in South Korea. So um, we've got a, a customer in South Korea. And before we started working with them, we realized we had to do some uh, research into uh, the area. And they have a tremendous about amount of disability laws and acts. Um, it looks amazing until you realize they're in the same position. The The understanding of how they affect these laws is a little limited. So this is not an issue that is um, solely um, attributed to Turkey. This is something that every nation will encounter at some stage of its accessibility journey, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So obviously Turkey is a candidate state for, for EU membership. Um, and do you, do you think that, that this candidature is having an effect on how it's implementing disability legislation or trying to 
change what it does in relation to, to disability to help it align with with Europe, albeit that European approaches are, are no, by no means unified uh, and there's you know, fragmentation across member states. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there is, there's a concerted push and a concerted effort. Um, and w within the government itself, a, a real desire to make these changes happen. The biggest issues that the EU have asked them to address, mainly based, uh, as far as disability um, equality goes, are mainly based upon uh, accessible environments. So we're not talking digital or, or anything, but purely physical accessible environments. Um, and I think that they've put a tremendous amount of money in making a lot of their government offices and local authority buildings accessible. And they have, they've done a tremendous amount of, of work towards that. But logistically speaking, uh, looking at the, the vastness of the country and the terrain that they would have to cover. I mean, even the infrastructure of the roads, is, you may have an accessible building, but how are you going to get to that building? You know, it's a massive challenge. And I don't think um, you were given enough time. Personally, I think this is something that the UK has not yet achieved. Um, you can hardly classify London as the most accessible place in the world. So how can we expect um, Turkey to do the same thing? So, um, so for people that don't know, what are the timescales that have been been issued? They've been extended a few times. Um, I think it was 2012 uh, was the last one. And the next one, I think, is supposed to be at the end of 2015. So the, it's not it's not achievable. They were given, I think, from the outset around about six years, I think, was the start. But don't quote me on that. I'll have to check no. it. OK. Uh, I mean, even if you gave this country another 10 years, it would be difficult to achieve. It's, it's a journey. Yeah, very and, and, and much. If so. we look at if we look at our own transport infrastructure in the UK, they're still working on the tube stations right now. So um, absolutely, it, it's not something that that anyone is perfect at. No, the, um, what, what, sorry, but, but you mentioned that that this target doesn't apply to digital. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, at the moment, as far as Turkey is concerned. Digital accessible environments are um, not considered by government, by um, uh, non-monetary bodies, if you like. When you look at large corporations uh, that understand the value, they may have dealings in other countries that have accessibility laws. Uh, they may understand that they're, they're obviously there is a commercial, a business case for making their the environments accessible that's different they are actually uh, looking to make their environments accessible and Turkish Airlines being one of them although Turkish Airlines is unique as it is also a government uh, agent an agency and um, so it sits in both camps um, but no it's not it's just generally physical accessibility and what we've had uh, and what we've seen over these last few years are uh, mis misuse is a bit of a strong word but um, a lack of understanding of how to achieve this physical accessibility. So an example, and you'll see it if you Google it, um, on many of our journeys, on many of our visits, we speak to uh, a lot of organisations, whether they're charities, whether they're groups, whether they're corporations. We, we, we go to a lot of people and, and, and talk and find out what is going on. And when you visit, um, for example, Istanbul, Sultanahmet, which is a major tourist destination, you will see a lot of tactile paving. Uh, when you go to Ankara, which is obviously the capital city, you will see again a lot of tactile paving. Now, what has happened is a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So they understand that tactile is something that is useful for people with disabilities. But the people, and I will say this, I think a lot of these people have been foreign contractors, have come in and implemented this tactile uh, paving um, as a decorative feature. So you will see that going round trees and, you know, really nice little little features. We were horrified. Um, and actually, I, I did speak to them and they did something about it straight away. The brand new Bosphorus crossing, which is amazing. It's a, it's a, a tunnel that goes completely under the Bosphorus. Um, the tram, the tactile, takes you right off the end of the platform, <laughs> which was I could not believe when we saw, but they addressed it straight away. So I think what happens is, is that um, an organization may identify that, look, we, we could do work here, we can we can 
um, do some business here, and we can implement this, and we can implement that. They're not giving the the extra knowledge and and um, uh, wherewithal to to understand and implement these things correctly. So, so let's say if if a disabled person needs to interact with with government, mm -hmm. so it it will be forced to go to a physical place. There's no way for that person to do that online without the need of you know moving herself. Very very difficult. Um, in all fairness, the a lot of the government agencies have done their best on their own to make their environments accessible, um, and they have. But a lot haven't because not because they don't want to or they think it's not worth it. They just simply don't understand the concept because they don't already understand that perhaps um, as a blind person I can achieve you know many many things. I can do the most professional jobs. They don't understand that these technologies are available then they're not going to understand that concept. Mm. Okay, so there's a big awareness campaign that, that, that needs to happen, or, or not just a campaign, an initiative, um, because effectively you've got chicken and egg. Until mm. the tools are available, until the understanding of the tools are available, there are only going to be dead-end jobs for people with disabilities. So therefore, the expectations, etc., are going to be worse. So I, I think Antonio's raised uh, a good point here. Mm. Um, what about in education? Uh, are the universities pro providing materials that are accessible? Are they making efforts to encourage students with disabilities? Some. Some are. Now, um, the Middle Eastern Technical University um, have done quite a lot with their students with disabilities. Um, and again, they understand that the perception is a lot better and they do understand that, that students with disabilities may need different aids, may need different technologies, may need more time and, and so on. And some universities are doing this. But again, it's a struggle because as with the UK, accessibility um, has been seen to be the charitable thing to do, not a necessity, not law, and mm -hmm. not the right thing to do. So a lot of the time it's perceived as being a, a nice optional extra. Um, and I don't think, you know, they're not on their own. They're, even in this country, um, we've got a, a group of universities that um, I'm talking to at the moment who uh, their environments are not accessible. So it's going to be the same. It's the same here as it is there. Okay. Mm. Do, do you think that whilst the similarities, the, the, the landscape, or rather UK is further on? Because oh, yes, yes, it is. Um, and one thing we found, um, and I mean no criticism to any of the agencies when I'm saying this, um, but you have a lot of money at the moment being put into tenders, uh, and opportunities in Turkey for people to um, carry out disability-related services. Um, and in this country, we're you know we're really far ahead. We we know what we're doing. We've got our our, our infrastructure in place. But even now, you know, we're still struggling. Turkey is a, is way further behind us than 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 I would like them to be. Um, but it, it's it's really understandable. Um, but what we're seeing is is many. Um, a process of evaluation is going to be needed. When tenders, uh, for example, EU are put out, who evaluates the tenders? Um, when companies come in, a lot of them are British. Um, they may do the work, but there's no knowledge transfer. So whereas we're way ahead, we should have a responsibility to help other countries, not just Turkey, but other countries, with our knowledge transfer. And I would expect that this to be not just a charitable knowledge transfer, not just a governmental, but I would expect that uh, businesses, uh, large corporates and even SMEs need to play their part in that. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely fair. Mm -hmm. Really, the need the knowledge share. Um, you, there's way too much work for any one company, so it's not like they're going to lose out uh, exactly. in, in terms of workload by creating people with skills and sharing their skills. If anything, in a market that's this new, you're more likely to be generating more business. Yeah. So um, sharing the skills, increasing the knowledge, uh, 
generating awareness hugely important. Uh, Antonio, did you have a question? No, I uh, just do you feel that in this way we share information between between different countries. Do you think with Turkey we may have an issue with the language could be a barrier? I thought initially when I first started um, visiting organizations within Turkey that the language is going to be a barrier. As, as Neil pointed out, I got a hell of a Welsh accent, <laughs> a very strong Welsh accent. Um, and my English is a little bit wingless, but in Turkey they speak far better English than I do. So there's a lot um, of English speakers in Turkey. And if you if you happen to be around somebody who isn't an English speaker, then there's going to be somebody next to him that is. So language is, is very limited. And if anything, um, what I found with the, the Turkish thirst for knowledge and the desire to learn is tremendous. We've um, we've been part of the Great Campaign, which is a, a UK government initiative to take British services and um, products across the globe. And we, we've carried out that campaign with them in Turkey. Um, and we found that the entrepreneurialship of some of the, the Turkish um, citizens is amazing. Some of the technologies they've created for people with disabilities is mind-blowing and wonderful. No language barriers there at all. And most of these softwares that have been created are actually in English and Turkish. No. So I think um, the language is not going to be a barrier. And the knowledge transfer certainly won't be a barrier. The only barrier we're going to have is getting people to understand it's okay to share this knowledge, whether you're a commercial organization or not. And not only is it okay, it's our responsibility. Okay. So... Um I've got a question following on from that, that which kind of answered, but maybe not. So what about text-to-speech and, and so on? Are there any decent text-to-speech voices in Turkish, for instance? There are, yes, and there's a number of free ones. So okay. it, there's plenty of open source. So if you look out, we've even got Welsh, by the way, nice little free Welsh synthesizer. You know, the, the text-to-speech can be really, really expensive. Yes. But if you know where to look, you can pick up some of the open source stuff that's just been developed for free. So, okay. yeah, there's a couple of voice synthesizers. There's a couple of text-to-speech. There's um, there's two, I believe, voice activation softwares. There's there's quite a lot. So And somebody's quite exciting. Okay. okay. And, and are the mobile devices being used? And are, 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 what type of technology are people using within those devices? The chicks love their technology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's really, really bad, though, because... When I'm here, I can pick up uh, a tablet, you know, £99. I can get a really nice uh, mobile 4G, you know, maybe 150, 200 quid. You go to Turkey, uh, where these devices are often manufactured, mm -hmm. and the prices in comparison to, to the, the living wage are astronomical. Uh, but the, that still does not stop. Uh, people with a passion for technology and the Turks really love the technology so the amount of uh, products that are being produced and sold, digital technology products being produced and sold in Turkey is incredible it's um, it's far more I would say I don't, I don't have figures but it's far more than the UK so mm. you'll see everybody with their mobile devices uh, the only problem that, we, that I have realised is that that's not being introduced into schools so mobile technologies, there was a, a, a massive, um, it's a really, really uh, good project, and the name has escaped me now, unfortunately, where all schools, it was introduced that all schools, every pupil would have uh, a tablet or a laptop, every single pupil. And it's taken quite a few years to carry out, and they're still carrying on. Um, I think General Mobile might have been one of the, the companies involved. There's quite a few um, to deliver these amazing tablets to every student but yet there were no accessibility features from what i can gather I've tried to do some research and tried to find out um there were no accessibility uh, in board on board features which is a shame because some of these kids uh, are bound to have uh, disabilities so uh, it would have been nice to have seen that so mobile and technologies are not being brought into um primary and secondary education they are into high school and university but uh, as far as standard usage, yeah, I, I would guess it's more than the UK. 
Okay. So it just needs to flow down. Well, we have the same problems in the UK, though. So the disabled student allowance traditionally is funded you know, lots and lots of really good quality assistive tech, but you pretty much had to rely on your school or parents to provide stuff up until that point. So yeah. it's not, not an uncommon problem. Um, yeah, very true. Very true. It's the same, actually, I'd say the same in most countries. But so so having not been um, to Turkey, I'm interested to know uh, whether there's a big adoption of iPhones because iOS has, you know. It's the same as here, Neil. Yeah. We've got our iOS camp and we've yeah. got our Android camp and it's exactly okay. the same. And, but and there, there are a tremendous amount of uh, iOS users okay. and it does seem to be the favoured technology. Yeah, so it, it's certainly inbuilt accessibility Absolutely. And I'm an Android fan, but I have to give it to, to Apple. Yeah, I do. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, uh, when we're talking, it, um, I may have brought up some like negative issues and, and negative uh, thoughts on what's going on. But to be perfectly honest, these are things that every country has faced at some point in their journey. Um, but the thing about Turkey is uh, right now it's so exciting. It's such an exciting place to be right now. Um, I'm working at the moment with an amazing woman. She's um, a solicitor, a lawyer, practice in uh, employment law. Uh, she's blind and uh, she's just started and we've just had to get the first uh, guide dog, first ever guide dog association uh, set up in Turkey, which is wonderful. Um We've actually helped her to get online and, and get a, a fully um, accessible offering, but we're, we're doing a lot of other things together as well. Um, um, I didn't realise until I'd actually met the, the British ambassador uh, in Turkey, uh, Richard Moore, his wife Maggie, a uh, fantastic woman, um, is visually impaired. And until Maggie brought Star, who is a, her guide dog, uh, to the country, nobody really seen a good working guide dog before. They cured of them, but it hasn't really been okay. much in the news. Some people did have guide dogs, but very, very few. Um, and Richard Moore <laughs> actually said that that Star had taken more attention and more fame than than Richard or Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is really, really nice. And um, this is the first ever uh, guide dog association. So, you know, there's there's so many people that through uh, really difficult struggles have done some amazing things. It's definitely the place to be right now. Okay. So what do you think are going to be the, the next steps, both for you, um, as a, you know, as a small organization and, 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 and where do you, do you also see the, the, the government I, going you know, I, and legislation yeah. and, 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 and their direct, what's their direction of travel? At the moment, their direction seems to be in at the right route, that they're going down the right way. Uh, there seems to be a real concerted effort right now. So we've got a series of EU tenders that are that are just come to fruition. There are a lot of uh, local government acts and national government acts based around uh, accessibility, albeit uh, physical, not digital. We've got a lot more of a push towards um, employment as well. But what we need, the next step should be, please bring on board uh, these expertise. And when the experts get into position, leave that knowledge there, encourage the, um, the the Turkish people to do it themselves. We ourselves are going to be starting up. I, I was uh, the rec responsible for um, creating the Shaw Trust, which is a UK charity, uh, first ever, uh, I suppose, high-end technical social enterprise, their uh, accessibility services. I did the same in Poland, and I'm actually going to do the same in Turkey. So we're hoping by the beginning of next year, we'll have uh, a team of people uh, with disabilities uh, fully employed out there, not just working for corporates, but actually pushing out a, a message. Um, but we will be a commercial service, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. So that's our journey. Well, I think that's I think that's exciting, and I also think that it's okay to be a commercial entity. So uh, do I. I, 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 do I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't see why everyone has to be charitable. Uh, everyone has a right to earn a good living, and if you can do it through your skills, then fantastic. Anyway, we've reached the end of our half hour. You've managed to do it, do so without any gaffes or bloopers. <laughs> Which is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Andrea. Thank, thank you, you, guys. I really thank enjoyed you. this. Thanks thank so you. much.